When it came to acquired programming, there were two ways Nickelodeon could take things. The first way was to get the rights to shows that pushed the channel into a new direction. You can see this with What Will They Think Of Next, which took the channel a step towards its future good-for-kids green vegetable reputation, a program in line with Cy Schneider's dreams of edutainment while holding off and actually creating his own programs. The other way you could take things is to get programs that already fit in with what you're doing at the moment. Nickelodeon's big headline show, Pinwheel, was a pleasant puppet show with shorts, and one of their other major productions, Hocus Focus, was a pleasant puppet show with shorts. Hey, why not get another pleasant puppet show with shorts? And short of somehow getting the rights to Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Nickelodeon managed to get one of the best pleasant puppet shows with shorts around. Oh, I'm glad you helped me. Yeah. I even read the instructions on it, and it says, always... Aim it up and never at anyone. Okay, well then we will aim it up. And I just want to tell all of you to be sure and ask your mom or dad or maybe a big brother or sister to help you when you have a little bit of trouble because they probably like helping you. And it's a nice way to share a really fun time. And kids appreciate it. Right, don't get impatient. No. Do things slowly the right way. Don't try to go fast and get mad and do it the wrong way. Right. Should we try and fly it? Let's I'm gonna, go I'm going to give it a throw. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, here we go. Outside of the treehouse, though. Yeah. Everybody ready? Here we go. Hey. hey. Bye, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Dusty's Treehouse originally aired between 1968 and 1980 on KNXT, the CBS station for the Los Angeles area. The premise was simple. Our human host, the titular Dusty, lives in his treehouse with his three puppet children, Scooter the Squirrel, who's soft-spoken and a little emotionally delicate, Maxine the Crow, boisterous and a little bossy, and Stanley the Spider, affectionate and loving. The main segments of the show involved our four characters spending their days in the treehouse, playing games and having little make-believe sessions, like pretending to turn each other into food. Oh, you alright, wise guy! I wish you were a walnut! <gasps> Maxine? Yes? Did it? Yes, it worked. <laughs> now you're a walnut. Hey, what's this great big sandwich doing on the craft table? Come on, great big sandwich. You're supposed to be a craft. Not supposed to be on the craft table. Silly games often gave way to little life lessons, like how hard things would be if you didn't clean up after yourself, or how an item you might see as meaningless might have sentimental value to someone else. This old cob may not look like much to you. It's old and dry and yellow, and a little moldy too. But this old cob means an awful lot to me. What looks like junk holds hunks of memories. Dusty was also in possession of a hot air balloon, which he would use to take his audience on a trip to interesting places around the world, which translated into Dusty narrating over documentary footage of animals, factories, and offices, often with ridiculously good soundtracks. What is this music? Is this Mannheim Steamroller? I love it! Outside of the three reoccurring characters within the treehouse setting, a number of one-off puppets would perform skits in a black void, often accompanied by Dusty's narration. Sometimes these segments were educational, like a stylized lesson on the human digestive system. The Stomach The little intestine. Better 
better yet, were performances of fairy tales and folk legends, like this retelling of Cinderella. You have to be home by midnight, or when the clock strikes twelve, my magic will cease, and all these pretty things will be as they were before. All except the shoes, of course. And you can just throw those in the Bougainvillea. I'll pick them up in a day or two. All this combined created a very fleshed out and rounded package. From one half hour episode, you could expect to get some fun skits with life lessons, educational shorts and fairy tales, as well as the occasional musical number. And you know what? It's pretty great. It has a very open, inviting atmosphere, it doesn't talk down to kids, and it's very, very charming. If I were older, or if reruns had aired into the 90s, I could totally see Dusty's Treehouse being a childhood favorite of mine. Dusty's Treehouse was the brainchild of Stuart M. Rosen, who had gotten into television pretty much the second after graduating Long Beach State. His first job was for KCET, the NET affiliate for Burbank. Two years in, he had already moved up to the role of producer, and in 1966, created and hosted a black and white children's program called Dusty's Attic. As far as I could tell, the only connection between Dusty's Attic and Dusty's Treehouse was Rosen playing a character named Dusty, but the Dusty in Dusty's Attic was more simple and easily confused. If the Dusty from Dusty's Treehouse is Mr. Rogers, then the Dusty from Dusty's Attic was Steve from Blue's Clues. There isn't a whole lot known about this show, except for the fun trivia that it featured the first acting role for this guy. Hi, Tex. Hi. That's uh, short for howdy. <laughs> hey, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but didn't I just see you behind that picture over there? No. Look, you see, it was my imagination. <laughs> hey, since your name is Tex, uh, you must be from Texas. <laughs> nope, I'm from Louisiana. <laughs> well, how come your name is Tex if you're from Louisiana? Ain't nobody gonna call me Louise. And then I did one of the episodes where I needed a banjo player. So I couldn't find one quickly. So I called this friend of mine who was still at the university in Cal State Long Beach. That's where Steve Martin came from also. Spielberg also. Um, and um, I said, I really need a banjo player. Do you know a banjo player? And she said, yes. I know one, she said, and his name is Steve Martin. I said, oh, okay. So she gave me his number, I called him. I said, I need a banjo player, would you be willing to do it? He said, yes. And we met, we talked, he was funny, I put him on the show. <laughs> Steve Martin uh, has done obviously many things and has done very well, and clips from this show were used when, uh, when he received the Kennedy Center honors. You'll have to excuse this, by the way, but the only video interview of Stu Rosen available is from this god-awful political comedy show called Uncle Glenn's Political Peanut Gallery. It's total garbage, but it's worth it just to see Stu Rosen slag on the host for how poorly prepared he is. What did you do with my notes? Here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, look at this. This is this is his, these are his notes. That is. I mean, I had I mean, better he's got notes like three things then... written on here. Uh, you know, here, here's your notes. Please, let's not have a vulgar scene, shall mm -hmm. we? Dusty's Attic aired for one year. Rosen was then approached by CBS to produce the show for their Los Angeles affiliate. The program was changed to Dusty's Treehouse because, well, who has an attic in Los Angeles? And the concept was reworked. The bulk of the puppet work was done by Tony Urbano, his first real gig before doing puppeteering and animatronic work in Hollywood, including becoming the lead puppeteer of Team America World Police. Now, that's about as far in tone from Dusty's Treehouse as you can get. The show's music was composed by Barbara Rotman, who worked mostly in theater. A small team produced these episodes fast, and while for the most part it worked, you can still catch some rough edges in what little footage we have available to us. Here's a scene with Dusty narrating over some footage of fish, proceeding to identify some of the fish wrong. This is the Black Ghost Night. They have their fins on their bellies, you see that? This is the Black Ghost Night. I'm sorry, I made an error there. This is the Black Ghost Night. And their fins are on their bellies, and this is unlike any other fish. You see the fins on the bottom? 
Uh, d do we want to do another take? Nah, nah, it's almost six, and we're the only two people here, and I gotta go to my son's Easter pageant in like eight minutes. Just print it. Maybe this was left in to give the show some kind of charm of immediacy, but more than likely, this was just winging it on set. Winging it done with compassionate people who love making children's television, but winging it all the same. And while I'm here pointing out some of the show's flaws, Dusty's Treehouse does still have a few of those outdated elements. Things that were considered totally acceptable back then, but wouldn't fly or shouldn't fly today. Hey, who wants some offensive Romani stereotypes? Dad, I'm Sonia. <laughs> Fortune telling, magic spelling. Hot bandana, set in sash. If you want to see the future, cross a gypsy's palm with cash. Hey! I know, it's just one of those things where you just have to sigh and say it was a different time, and you know it wasn't done with malice, but yeah. We just gotta keep learning as a society. And for every misstep Dusty's Treehouse made, it also made some very interesting creative decisions. Remember when I said that the puppet characters were Dusty's children? I meant that quite literally, as in these three characters were legally adopted by Dusty. This led to direct, positive discussion on adoption within the show. So, I went down to the Dowdy Downs Adoption Agency where they have squirrels. And I looked and there were whole bunches of little squirrels. In fact, I wanted to take them all home. They all looked so cute. But there was this one particular little squirrel, a little blue one who was jumping up and down, and he was really just carrying on, and he was really so, so cute. And I said, say, I'll tell you what, I would really like to have that little squirrel that's really jumping around like that. And they said, fine. And so I brought you home, and you've been here ever since. And I've loved you very much ever since. And that was and me. Was that was you, yeah. right. And you chose me over all those other that's squirrels, right. huh? That's right. Well, I'm kind of special then. That's right extra special because I got a chance to select you specifically. That's pretty cool. Dusty's Treehouse was made outside of the PBS ecosystem, but it took a lot of good lessons from that part of television and made a show that was, issues of antiquity aside, very open, inviting, and supportive of its children audience, teaching life lessons without talking down to kids. And if you remember a while back, I brought these glasses on and I was mentioning that each one has a personality of its own, like here's a tall, skinny guy, and here's a short, fat guy, and here's a little short girl, and here's a medium-sized boy, and they're all different. But the thing that really impressed me was that though they're all different, this little gal, this little chubby fella, this little fella with a bow tie, and Tex here, yeah, it takes. And this little skinny guy. And this skinny guy. Whoops. The important thing is, no matter how tall you are, how short you are, or how fat you are, it's what's inside that counts. And it was a big hit, airing 260 episodes over a 12-year run and winning a whopping seven Emmys. Well, Los Angeles Emmys. Did you know regional Emmys were a thing? I didn't until doing research for this episode. I always just assumed it was just primetime and daytime Emmys. It also won a Peabody Award in 1973. Dusty's Treehouse was the pride of the Los Angeles area. It played very, very briefly in national syndication near the end of its run, but in 1980, it was time to close up shop. Nickelodeon picked up the rerun rights quickly afterwards, and for most people outside of the Los Angeles area, that's how they would end up experiencing the show. So, what did Dusty's Treehouse have to offer the young cable channel? Well, seven Emmys and a Peabody, of course. Having a show with such accolades this early in the channel's lifespan was a big catch. You could lean into those awards when trying to sell the channel to new subscribers. There was also some potential word of mouth. Anybody chatting with their Los Angeles relatives might have caught wind of this charming CVS puppet show. But beyond that, Dusty's Treehouse really seemed to slot in well with the atmosphere created with shows like Pinwheel and Hocus Focus. In fact, it offered a subtle but nonetheless effective ying to Pinwheel's yang. Pinwheel, the new hotness, had better production values and a larger cast, but focused less on educational topics and life lessons and more on just having a good time with friends. 
Dusty's treehouse was a little rough around the edges and quieter in tone and volume, but was actually educational in matters of both academic and emotional. Dusty's treehouse was preschool, while Pinwheel was recess. They complement each other, and that's not an easy thing to find, especially when one of those shows is a show you didn't make. Dusty's Treehouse was a fixture on Nickelodeon until 1984, when Nickelodeon's management changed and the channel went in a fresh direction. The Cy Schneider years is not my favorite era of Nickelodeon, but Dusty's Treehouse was one of its good decisions, and I'm glad for a time it could be shared with the rest of the country. Nickelodeon doesn't seem to have the rights to the show anymore, and there's never been a peep of any home video release. The nearest thing available is the Steve Martin footage from Dusty's Attic, which you can find in this box set of Martin's television work. At this moment, the only Dusty's Treehouse available is a few scattered episode fragments on YouTube, though one of them is a half-hour best-of special which offers a perfect sample platter of the show. I know for a fact that some people have episodes in their private collections. I've seen at least two episodes floating around on old tape trading forums from the late 90s, though any attempts to track down these people just resulted in dead email addresses. Somewhere, in some distant closet, sits a VHS with a few Dusty's Treehouse episodes, just waiting to be rediscovered. After Dusty's Treehouse, Stu Rosen found a new career in animation, doing casting, directing, and voice acting, working on projects from My Little Pony to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to the Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa to Two Stupid Dogs. Rosen's work slowed down to the 21st century, though he popped up from time to time, most notably a guest spot in HBO's Rome. His last IMDb credit was in 2012, and there's been no word of him since. You can only hope that he's enjoying a nice, quiet retirement. Proud of the work he's done. We're coming back uh, next week. Next month? When are we coming back? And we are coming back. I swear, uh, it's a threat. We're coming back, and uh, we would love to have you be our guest again when we come back in another month and change our shirts and pretend that it's a different day. <laughs> Won't you do that for us, please? I'll think about it. <laughs> God, Stu hated that show so much, and it's my everything. And thus ends the story of Dusty's Treehouse. Well, not really. Remember how I said Nickelodeon didn't have the rights anymore? About that. So Nickelodeon ended its run on Dusty's Treehouse the same year the Cable Communication Policy Act of 1984 was passed. This was an amendment to the existing Communication Act of 1934, establishing national policy on the regulation of cable television. We'll be seeing this act pop up from time to time. It's going to shape how television worked through most of the 80s until now. But for our purposes today, we're going to focus on section 612, which establishes the idea of least access television. According to the act, cable operators are required to set aside channel space, between 10 to 15% of the channel space they have, for commercial use by unaffiliated video programmers. Basically, if you're a cable provider with 40 channels, four of those channels must be available to lease for local television operations. That means anybody could potentially broadcast their own cable channel if they had the funds to lease the space. However, these leases tended to be prohibitively expensive, so it didn't happen terribly often. Okay, now let's jump forward a dozen years, and the Clinton administration is working on policy that would require stations to show three hours of children's educational, nonviolent programming a week. This actually went back to 1990 with the Children's Television Act during the Bush Senior Administration, but no hard number of hours was actually given in that. And dang it, Clinton putting his foot down to give the world wholesome children's entertainment would really help during this re-election year. So I want you to imagine, imagine it's 1996 and you're freshly retired in your early 60s, enjoying all sorts of free time in your very nice house in Burbank, California. You have three kids and four grandchildren who give you a ton of joy and you want them to have a good future but you're not sure how. One day, you're sitting in your easy chair, reading a Reader's Digest condensed book, when there's a knock on the door. You get up to see who it is. Hi, Dealing Dan Hawk here, and have I got a deal for you. How would you like to have your own cable channel? No, no, I mean it. I represent Olympic Entertainment, and we're running something called Children's Cable Network. 
See, according to the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984, cable companies have to leave a certain amount of channels to the public. Anybody can technically gobble these channels up, but it's very expensive to lease the space. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, what Olympic Entertainment has is a huge block of programming ready to go, but we need to pay that lease. Okay, you ask, so you're asking for donations? No, 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 no. We're not looking for handouts. We're looking for investors. This is a money-making opportunity. You invest your money in the Burbank chapter of Children's Cable Network. When we have enough to lease the channel, then we sell advertising space. The profit we make from advertising goes back to you. You make back your investment and then some. The more you invest, the more you make. Okay, you say, but what's going to bring advertisers to your program? Right now, President Clinton is drafting up new policy that makes it so cable stations have to run three hours of educational children's programming a week, which is great. We should have a quality, wholesome programming for this new generation of youngsters, you know, like in the good old days. But that's going to take way, way too long. These new policies won't kick in until late 97, maybe not until 98. We can get ahead of the curve and start providing that content right now. These advertisers know it's coming. They're getting antsy for it. And when we're the first ones to offer it, they'll charge right towards it like an elephant running over my used car lot. No, sorry, that, that's in the past. Point is, this is going to be what television is eventually. Advertisers want this, and therefore your investment is guaranteed to pay off. Look, you say, that sounds really interesting, but you're not sure. Well, I haven't told you what programs we're going to air. We've got some classics. We got Bill Cosby, we got Sherry Lewis, you know, Lamb Chop, and oh, here's a blast from the past. A local favorite, Dusty's Treehouse. Ah, I saw your eyes light up. I bet your kids watch Dusty's Treehouse all the time. That was a great show. Local hit. Hasn't been on the air for like 10 years. We're bringing it back. Just in time for your grandkids to enjoy the charming educational adventures of Dusty and his puppet friends. We're the only ones who've got it. We're the only ones who can put Dusty's Treehouse back on TV. Think about it. Your grandkids get to enjoy this all-time classic and you make a profit off your investments, which can go to their college funds. You can spoil your grandkids twice over. So, what do you say? At some point after the show's cancellation on Nickelodeon, Dusty's Treehouse became a pawn of the Olympic Entertainment Group, which was, to put it lightly, a big, fat scam. It didn't start that way. The brains of the operation was this guy, Dominic Orsatti. In the mid to late 70s, Ersati started up an animation production company called Ersati Productions. Their main claim to fame was Metric Man, animated shorts meant to teach the metric system to American children. When the early 90s rolled around, Ersati was sitting on all this animation that wasn't making rotation, and perhaps wondered if he could repackage this material and resell it. So Ersati got a 12 to 18 million dollar startup to create Olympic Entertainment. What Ersati did with that money was to purchase the broadcast rights to whatever eye-catching children's programming he could get his hands on. What's interesting is that the three main shows he managed to get the rights to had all passed hands with Nickelodeon at some point. You had Dusty's Treehouse, you had Bill Cosby's Picture Pages, which had been edited in the pinwheel, and you had The Sherry Show, which we'll be talking about when Nick Knacks gets to 1987. I can't say for sure, but it, it feels like Arsati went dumpster diving behind Nickelodeon's house. He grabbed a couple of other minor shows, threw in his Metric Man stuff, and labeled this material Children's Cable Network. Okay, here's how the scam worked. Olympic Entertainment would enlist certain regional marketing firms in the lower California area, effectively franchising. These marketing firms would then use salespeople or telemarketing to enlist local citizens as investors, mostly targeting business owners and retirees. The citizens invest their money, which is supposed to go into leasing airspace for the children's cable network, and in theory make their money back plus profit from ad revenue. Okay, the trick here was keeping things regional, keep the money compartmentalized. All the money together could definitely afford lease space in one or maybe even a couple of markets, 
but the couple hundred thousand dollars invested in Region A couldn't afford the lease in Region A's cable market. Same for Region B and C and so on. So each region is designated a failure. The marketing companies tell the investors, whoops, sorry, we failed. We didn't mean to, but you know how it is. Investing in business is a gamble. While the money collected altogether went right into Olympic Entertainment's pocket. All told, Olympic Entertainment netted $17 million from 1,200 investors, and Children's Cable Network never went on the air. Gene DiMatteo, a Sun Valley investor, put in $10,000. Judy Klopfer, a Torrance nurse, invested ten dollars A Westside minister put up his $125,000 retirement stash. A retired Lexington, Kentucky dentist committed $60,000. Orsati, when asked by the Los Angeles Times about all of this, replied with this. I'm sorry these people lost money, but I can show you franchises with major corporations that haven't made it. There's a Chili's that just closed here on a major street. Chili's? Chili's? Orsati, the difference between you and that Chili's is that Chili's actually opened, you scumbag. They didn't go door to door to get money from hapless grandparents. They didn't hinge their business model on nostalgia for local television hits. And they didn't take the money and run. They actually opened their doors and actually sold baby back ribs. That Chili's had more integrity than you'll ever have. So things went to court. Some people got their money back. I've had trouble finding the exact results of the court hearings. But I know that by the turn of the century, Olympic Entertainment was no more. I don't know what happened to the broadcast rights for these shows, if they're still in Orsati's hands or not, but it would be way, way too sad if this was the final impact Dusty's Treehouse made on the world. It's just way too wholesome and charming and loving to have been used like this. Dusty's Treehouse deserves to be said in the same breath like shows like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Captain Kangaroo, not forgotten after being a tool of a con artist. Stu Rosen deserves to be recognized for his skills as a performer and creator, not as a tired guest on a crappy politics show. We can't leave it here. We can't let it rest here. I'm doing my part for Dusty's Treehouse. Can you say the same? Nick, 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 Next time, Nickelodeon revises their children's talk show format with special guest performers, Baby R.E.M. Today's shout-out goes to Hi There, Boys and Girls, America's Local Children's TV Programs by Tim Hollis. This is a great general history on local children's television, including a small but decent section on Dusty's Treehouse. If you're interested in more obscure TV, this is a great book to have in your library. One thing I promise is not a scam is my Patreon. Patreon is what gives me the time and resources to focus on knickknacks and other popperiness shows. So if you like what you see, perhaps consider dropping a dollar or two over there. Every little bit helps. Liking, sharing, subscribing also helps. And don't forget to hit that bell icon when you subscribe. That's the best way to keep up with everything the popperina has going on. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.